So uh, uh, this sutta is uh, uh, another well-known sutta, and uh, this is spoken by Venerable uh, Sariputta. Venerable Sariputta, of course, was the Buddha's right-hand monk. Yeah, so very important part of the Sangha. And uh, it is kind of interesting when Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahamogalana, when they had died, yeah, after they passed away, the Buddha said that the Sangha seems empty now that they have passed away. Yeah, so it's almost as if the Buddha really recognized the preeminent spiritual qualities of Venerable Sariputta and Mahamogalana to the point that the Sangha seemed empty even to the Buddha. So you can imagine, even if you are an arahant, you still sometimes you can perceive that you know you perceive the changes of things. It's not that the Buddha was sad. It's not that the Buddha was grieving, but merely uh, noting the emptiness that was left behind when two such powerful people passed away. So it was almost like the Buddha's appreciation of these two teachers. And uh, for this reason, you find that some of the most deepest and most powerful suttas uh, in the Pali Canon, of course, most of them are taught by the Buddha, but some of them are taught by Venerable Sariputta, especially Venerable Sariputta. He is like uh, an expert in giving a detailed expositions and all of these kind of things. Uh, and in this sutta, that is exactly what we see. We see Venerable Sariputta giving a detailed exposition on the four uh, elements uh, that we have just been talking about before. Uh, so now hopefully we will get some clarity about how to contemplate the four elements uh, and how to use that in our own life to make it a, a proper meditation practice. Uh, so this is called the uh, uh, longer simile of the elephant's footprint. Uh, the sutta before MN27 is called the shorter sutta on the simile's footprint. Uh, and the MN27 is also a very beautiful sutta, uh, but uh, not for this time, maybe for, for another time. Uh, and that is a sutta on the gradual training. It was a sutta that was taken to Sri Lanka by Venerable Mahinda. And he taught that to the royal court in Sri Lanka. And then the royal court became stream enters, Yeah, and they became Buddhist as a consequence of that sutta. But now we're talking about the longer sutta on the simile of the elephant's footprint. Uh, and uh, it is an exposition on the four elements. So let's see what this sutta has to say here. So uh, it starts off as usual. So I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove, another Pindika's monastery here. There Sariputta addressed the monks or the mendicants, reverence, mendicants, Reverend, they replied, and Sariputta said this. So again, we are in Savati, we are in the Jeta Grove and at the Pindakas Monastery. So many suttas were spoken in this particular monastery here. And uh, they are always very polite to each other. They call each other reverend or, or something like that. Uh, it's kind of nice. Avuso, I think, is the Pali word here. And Avuso is a kind of a polite way of saying friend or something like that. Uh, maybe it means something like sir. I'm not sure exactly how to translate it. I think reverend is okay. So this is what Venerable Sariputta says. Uh, the footprint of all creatures that walk can fit inside an elephant's footprint. Uh, so an elephant's footprint is said to be the biggest of them all. In the same way, all skillful qualities uh, can be included in the four noble truths. Uh, what for? The noble truth of suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the practice leading to the cessation of suffering. So here we have the idea that uh, uh, the four noble truths are like an elephant's footprint because the elephant leaves a large, large footprint uh, and all other beings, the footprint fits inside the elephant's footprint. Uh, so uh, uh, all skillful qualities are included in the noble truths, uh, four noble truths. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, it means that if you think about the four noble truths, uh, you think about what they mean. Yeah? You think about, for example, the 
Noble Eightfold Path, which is part of that, yeah, you know that all good qualities inside of a person, yeah, I think the Pali word is all kusala dhamma, and all kusala dhamma, all wholesome qualities are included within those four noble truths. Anything that you think that is wholesome, that is positive, anything you do, anything you say, is somehow part of these four noble truths. This is one way of looking at this. There is another way of looking at this because the Pali word kusala dhamma has actually two different meanings. One meaning is that it refers to skillful qualities, but another meaning is that it refers to good teachings. Yeah, dhamma can also mean teachings, and kusala dhamma can mean any wholesome teaching. Yeah? And the good teaching that you hear from the Buddha or Buddhism is a kusala dhamma. So another way of thinking about it is that all good teachings, yeah, that there are, fit within the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths is like an overall framework, and everything, every other teaching in Buddhism can somehow be understood as falling within the Four Noble Truths. Yeah? So these are two different ways of thinking about it. One is like the way we talk about the doctrine, the teaching, and the other way is more psychological, the qualities inside of us. All those good qualities inside of us also fall within those Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths, of course, are very important on the Buddhist path, precisely because they are the container that include everything else. And it is always the same, the Four Noble Truths always starts off with the Noble Truth of suffering. Yeah. And uh, remember that these Four Noble Truths, uh, they are to be understood. Uh, yeah, the idea here is that we're supposed to gain insight into these Four Noble Truths. Uh, There's something that we're supposed to realize for ourselves, right? So we're supposed to realize suffering, to understand suffering. Uh, this is part of it. Uh, remember what I said at the beginning of the retreat, I said that one way of thinking about the right, the idea of right view uh, is that Right view in one way is understanding the difference between happiness and suffering. Yeah, this is what right view is. If you have right view, it means that you know where to look for happiness. You don't look for happiness in the wrong place. So many people in the world look for happiness in the wrong place. Sometimes people look for happiness in doing bad things. They do bad things to gain happiness. But if you really understand where to find happiness, you understand that the spiritual path is completely essential. Yeah, so this is what I was saying at the beginning, understanding happiness and suffering. This is one of the basic idea of right view. And here you have it again, yeah? The noble truth of suffering is exactly that. It's about understanding suffering. And if you understand suffering, you also understand happiness, two sides of the same coin, yeah? So this is kind of the core idea of right view, the idea of suffering and happiness. And of course, once you understand the idea of suffering and you understand happiness, part of that is understanding how these things originate. How do you become happy? How do you suffer? What is the reason for these things? And that is the second noble truth, the origin of suffering, why there is suffering in the world. And of course, we know the answer, the answer to the second noble truth uh, is that we suffer because of craving. And the idea that craving causes suffering is explained in dependent origination. Dependent origination is an expansion on the second noble truth. It shows you that craving, yeah, craving is factor number uh, seven, uh, seven, uh, number eight, right? <laughs> What is it, number eight, independent origination? Yeah, so it's factor number eight. So uh, that leads to suffering because down the track you have rebirth and then you have old age and suffering and death. But dependent or origination also tells you why there is craving. Yeah, why do we crave? That again is very useful to understand because when you understand why there is craving, then you can do something about it. And the cause of craving, of course, going into dependent origination all the way to the beginning is avidja, is ignorance or lack of understanding. 
So the whole purpose of dependent origination is to show us the causal structure of suffering, why there is suffering in the world, why there is happiness in the world. Yeah? This is the real problem. The origin of suffering is craving. Ultimately, the or origin of suffering is ignorance. So we have to eliminate the ignorance. We have to see the world in the right way. This is why vipassana, seeing things in the right way, becoming wise is so important because it destroys the ignorance at the beginning of dependent origination. And because it destroys the ignorance at the beginning, it destroys the craving. And then of course, suffering itself comes to an end as a consequence. So these are fundamental ways of thinking about the world. Yeah, this is really what this is about. And then you understand the cessation of suffering. Yeah, if you understand that ignorance is the cause of suffering, then the cessation of suffering happens when you become wise. When you give up ignorance, when you give rise to knowledge, when you give rise to insight and understanding, that is when you have the ending of suffering. And then you have the path that leads to the ending of suffering. And this is what we are talking about all the time, this beautiful path of Buddhism, the Noble Eightfold Path, starting with the right view, ending with Samma Samadhi. When you have the four jhanas, we have seen this just before in the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, how the, taking it all the way to the four jhanas. Yeah? Then when you have the four jhanas, then the insight happens. As a matter of course, it just happens because that is what the four jhanas do to you. They give rise to this kind of insight. So that is the Four Noble Truths. And really we should spend a lot more time on those, but uh, I think for now that is uh, sufficient. And now what Venerable Sariputta does, uh, he takes one of those noble truths uh, and then he focuses on that, uh, yeah? And then when he, after doing that, he will take one, one element of the next one and focus on that element. And it goes down like this in many different steps. So it's kind of, a, uh, I will show you how this kind of uh, expands out in a very kind of nice way. Uh, so let's um, move on to the next paragraph here. Uh, wait, going too far. So now we focus on the first of those four noble truths. Yeah. And the Buddha and the very Buddha says, what is the noble truth of suffering here? Yeah. Rebirth is suffering. <coughs> <coughs> Old age is suffering. Death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress are suffering. Not getting what you wish for is suffering. In brief, the five grasping aggregates are suffering. Yeah, let's, uh, let's stop there because the next one is really even more subdivided again. So this is the first noble truth. Yeah, this is to what we find in the suttas in so many different places. But you will notice it's a little bit shorter than the usual explanation of the first noble truth. The first noble truth also often has in it the idea that being unified with what you don't like is suffering or being together, being, uh, being separated from that which you love yeah, is suffering. That's also often part of this. That is missing here. So this is a slightly different way of expressing the first noble truth. Uh, but it's very interesting here. Yeah, The idea, the, the, what, what is going on here, it starts off off by saying, I'm going to comment this only very briefly because otherwise it's going to take too long, but this is a very profound teaching right there. So rebirth is suffering. Usually when this is translated, is it translated as birth is suffering? Yeah, but actually birth in the context of the Four Noble Truths, it actually means rebirth. And the reason it means rebirth is remember, we are trying to overcome suffering. Yeah, and because we are trying to overcome suffering and we cannot overcome suffering uh, in this, the birth in this life, that's impossible. The only birth we can overcome is the birth in future life. So for that reason, when we see birth in the connection with the first noble truth, it must mean rebirth, right? It must mean future birth. So the correct translation therefore actually is rebirth. 
Well, this is the first aspect here, but even outside of the first noble truth, whenever the word birth occurs in the suttas, we know that birth in ancient India always meant rebirth. Yeah? When the ancient Indians were talking about birth, they would always understand that as a rebirth. So when they were using the word birth, the word jati, they had a very specific idea about that, the idea of rebirth. So if we want to express what the Indians, the ancient Indians were hearing when they heard the word jati, if we want to express that properly, rebirth is actually the correct translation. So I say that if we're going to dis use the word uh, jati and translate it, I think rebirth actually is the best way of expressing this. So this is kind of fascinating, right? It's about using language, understanding language in the right way, and then expressing the meaning, what the ancient Indians were thinking, what they were meaning by these terms. We are expressing that rather than using a modern way of thinking and then translating the suit as according to the modern way of thinking. If we are using the modern way of thinking, we lose a lot of the meaning of the ancient suttas. We have to ask ourselves, what were the ancient Indians thinking when they were using these terms? So rebirth is suffering. And once you understand that it is about rebirth that is suffering, you can see that this first noble truth, what it really points to, it points to the future moving on in samsara, the future round the wheel of birth and death. That is really what it is pointing to, because otherwise the word rebirth doesn't make any sense. Yeah? Rebirth means we're talking about the wheel of existence, the wheel of carrying on, birth and death carrying on into the future. We're talking about samsaric existence, really. Once you have rebirth, you have old age, yeah? the falling apart of the body, getting weak, the sights and everything failing, the memory getting worse. Sometimes I feel that my memory is getting a bit worse already. I think already, wow, I'm not ready to die yet. I want to live a little bit longer. My memory already failing a little bit sometimes. I feel this is kind of no good, yeah? And uh, how old I am again? Well, I'm getting quite, getting much older now. So maybe it is okay if memory fails a tiny little bit sometimes, uh, but you don't want it to happen too fast. Getting old, yeah, is not nice because you compare yourself to the way you were before. It is suffering for most people. Uh, death is suffering, yeah? One of the very important aspects of human life. Uh, the idea that you have to give up everything in the world. Uh, everything has to go. Not only that, but you're also heading to an uncertain future. So you want to have a safeguard against those things. And that is very much a very large part of what we're doing on the Buddhist path. Death deserves a lot of mention, but I'll keep it very brief just for now. Otherwise, it's going to take us too long. Then we have sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress are suffering. That's quite obvious. Yeah. But remember that these things are inherent part of human life. Everyone has to have these things. And because they are inherent to human life, you cannot avoid them. That is why they are really problematic. Not getting what you want is suffering. Life is one long sequence of not getting what you want. You know what I mean? You never get exactly what you want. Life always throws up all kinds of challenges. You always have to settle kind of in a halfway house with half measures. You never get everything that you want. There's always disappointments. And this is another part of an aspect of life that has to be this way. Life is never going to be perfect. And when you don't get what you want, it is suffering. There's a gap between what you, where you want to be and what you actually get. And then comes the last part of this. Yeah, the... In brief, the five grasping aggregates are suffering here. And this is like a summary of the entire idea of suffering here. And of course, the five grasping aggregates, they are what we are. Yeah? These are the aspects of our personality. Here. And because they are the aspects of our personality, what this is saying, and this is a very profound truth, Right? This is really, really profound and really hard to understand for many people. But what this is saying, it is really saying that existence itself is suffering. 
existence is problematic because these five aggregates, the grasping aggregates, they are what constitutes existence itself. So this is really what the uh, brief summary of this teaching is. And that gives you kind of the outlook that you need to understand what is going on here. So that is the first noble truth, yeah? And uh, then the Buddha is going on to redefine, or rather when about Sariputta, going down to redefine this even further. But before we do that, let's just do a, have a, another short break and another short Q&A session. And we'll come back to this in a few minutes. So we had just had a look at the idea of the first noble truth, yeah, which is the idea of suffering. And as I just mentioned that the brief expression of that uh, is that the five grasping aggregates, or if you like the five aggregates that are grasped, they are suffering, yeah? So then Sariputta, he takes these five aggregates and he looks at one of the aggregate. Yeah? He's always going on to, he has a long list and then he chooses one item on that list. And now he chooses one item and he, well, then he says, well, he chooses one item from suffering, that's the five aggregates. And he says, what are the five grasping aggregates? They are as follows, the grasping aggregates of form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. Yeah? So uh, I, I assume that you are reasonably, know, you know roughly what the five aggregates are. Form is basically the body. Feeling is whether an experience is good, bad, or neutral. Perception is how we relate to the world, how we can understand the world. Choices is our intention, the will, how we try to create the world around us by doing and all of these kind of things. And consciousness is just the ability to be aware, yeah? to be aware of what is happening, to be conscious of the world around us. So the reason why the Buddha talks about these five aggregates it's basically to help us to focus in on certain aspects of existence where we need to have insight. This is where the self res resides. The self, the feeling of self resides mostly in one of these five aggregates. And this is one of the main reasons why the Buddha talks about this. So then he goes to one of the five aggregates. What is the grasping aggregate of form? And he says it is the four primary elements and form derived from the four primary elements. <clears throat> and of course, the four primary elements, these are the same things that we saw in the previous sutta, the sutta on mindfulness directed to the body, yeah? This is the earth element, four primary, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. So now you can see the connection between this sutta and the previous one. And also it is form derived from those four primary elements. So this would be any, anything really in the physical world that somehow is made up of these four uh, four elements. And one of the things that is meant here specifically is the five senses. Yeah, the five senses are a particular kind of form. The eye is a form which is sensitive to light, so we can see. The ear is a, uh, an organ that is sensitive to vibrations of the air, and that's why we can hear. So this is like the derived form. Yeah? But the main purpose here is to look at the four primary elements. What are the four primary elements? The elements of earth, water, fire, and air. What is the earth element? <laughs> so, so you can see how the Buddha, how Venerable Sariputta is working here. Yeah, he starts over the, over, with the four noble truths, and then he focuses on the first noble truth of suffering, and he says that the first noble truth of suffering, what that is, he focuses on the five aggregates. He asks, what are the five aggregates? He focuses on the form aggregate. He asks, what is the form aggregate? It is the four primary elements. He says, what are the four primary elements? And then he focuses on the earth element, yeah? 
going down, 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 narrowing down, yeah, focusing on one individual thing here. And of course, the interesting thing is that if we focus on one small area like that, one individual thing, it is surprising how much insight you can gain by focusing on a small thing, just like the earth element. And this is why we're going to consider this earth element in the quite a bit of detail uh, now. What is the earth element? And uh, when Bosariputta says the earth element may be interior or exterior. What is the interior earth element? Anything hard, solid, appropriated, yeah, that's internal pertaining to the individual. This, that in, this includes head hair, body hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, undigested food, feces, or anything else, hard, solid, appropriated, that is internal, pertaining to the individual. This is called the internal earth element. Yeah, so it starts off by saying there is the external element and the internal, uh, the internal earth element. Uh, the internal earth element is basically your body, yeah? You can see it is your body, that list, long list of things are all things that relate to the body. Whereas the external earth element is the whole world outside. It is other people, but also the whole world, as far as it is solid, as far as it is, has some kind of uh, uh, solidity attached to it, uh, yeah? And then, the, so the internal ele element, the internal earth element, uh, the interior earth element uh, is whatever is solid within you, that is hard, yeah? And that is appropriated. And the, the word appropriated here is the Pali word upadinna. It means that you are grasping these things. Yeah? Upadinna is related to the word upadana. And upadana, of course, has this idea of attaching to things, of appropriating, of taking hold of things, yeah? of, of, of uh, seizing something. Yeah? And uh, in dependent origination, you have, it goes from feeling, yeah? to craving, and then it has upadana. So when you crave, what you do is you take things up, you appropriate things, you take hold of things in the world. Why do you do that? Because you want to satisfy your craving. That is why we take hold of things in the world. We take hold of relationships. We take hold of a house of possessions. We take hold of ideas, of viewpoints. Yeah, we have views. We say Buddhism is the best, right? That is the view of Buddhists. <laughs> we think Buddhism is the best. And uh, are we right? Well, hopefully we are right. Yeah, because if we're not right, then we have a problem. But we tend to think Buddhism, is, that's just our view when you're a Buddhist. If you didn't think Buddhism was the best, you wouldn't bother being a Buddhist. You'd be something else. This is the whole point of being a Buddhist. So these are the things we appropriate. This is what Upadana is all about. And one of the things that we appropriate is all the physical ideas of the, of the body. This is mine. This is me. Don't touch me. Yeah, this is my body. Leave it alone. We have appropriated this body. It is mine. And then you start to analyze this body, all of these solid things, and you start to see that it has all of these elements, yeah, from head hair going all the way down to feces and anything else that is hard and solid. And of course, the list that you see here is exactly <clears throat> the same list, or it, it is a, a sub aspect or a subset of the list that we saw before. The list that we saw before had 31 parts. This has less. I haven't counted, not sure how many there is, uh, because these are all the hard, the solid aspects of the 31 parts of the body. This is the interior earth element. And now comes the inside part, yeah, the thing that we should reflect on. So the Bosariputta says that the interior earth element and the exter exterior earth element are just 
the earth element. This should be seen, truly seen with right understanding like this. This is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. When you truly see with right understanding, you grow disillusioned or you grow repelled. You are repelled by the earth element. You are detaching the mind from the earth element. And this is this idea I was talking about before. Yeah. When you realize that your body is actually the same as the earth elements outside. Where does your body come from? It comes from eating the plants. What are the plants? The plants have grown from the soil. They take up the nutriment in the soil. They take up the air outside. They use the sunlight for photosynthesis. They take up all the elements in the world. Then they become food for us. We eat that food. Then you have this body. It is made of all of these things from the outside. And then eventually the body goes back to this world when you die. Yeah, everything are going back to the elements. And then when you die, you decompose in the ground or they burn you in the cemetery. Sometimes we use the ashes when someone who is dead and we put it under the trees so the trees will grow better. It becomes nutriment for the next tree. And so the cycle just goes on and on like this. And there is really no distinction between what is dead and what is alive. Everything is the same thing. Your body and the external world are one and the same thing. So why are you holding on to this body? Why do you think it is yours? It belongs to nature. It doesn't belong to you at all. It is not that it belongs to other people either. It doesn't belong to anyone. It belongs to nature. It is part of the way that nature behaves. Sometimes nature creates these bodies. How does nature create these bodies? Well, it is through the, uh, the, the, you know, the Darwinian laws yeah, of evolution and through the Darwinian laws of evolution, through genetics and all of this, uh, these bodies come into existence. Uh, this is how animal bodies come into existence. Uh, it is all part of nature. So this is how you do this kind of contemplation. Uh, it's a very simple contemplation. It's really understanding in a deep way that you are not separate from the nature around you. Your physical body is just the same as the nature around you. Your mind is different. Yeah, your consciousness is not the same as nature around you. Your mind is different, but the physical body is not. And when you see that, you see this physical body being built up of the world around you. You eat porridge, yeah, or you eat rice or whatever it is to make you feel strong. Yeah? And then eventually things go back to rice and porridge again. Your body becomes the rice and porridge of the next person. And it goes on in cycles like that. Yeah? And when you reflect like that, you think, yeah, what is it I'm holding on to? I'm holding on to nothing. Yeah? I'm holding on to something that doesn't belong to me. Yeah? It belongs to the world around. It belongs to the nature around me. Yeah? And then you gain this right understanding. This is not mine. I cannot hold on to this body. I have very little control over it. If you want, if you don't want to grow old and you don't want to die, doesn't make any difference. You're still going to become old and die. There's not something you can do about that. In the meantime, you can kind of move this body a little bit. But at the end of the day, it is not really yours. Body does not belong to you. I am not this. Definitely, you are not the body. Yeah, you are not. This is not, not your. This is not myself. And the reason it is not yourself is precisely because it is out of control. One day you're going to have to give it all up. And so this body is almost like alien to you. And you need to be able to grasp this. You have to think about it quite a lot. Yeah, you have to reflect on it again and again. All of the reflections in the Buddhist suttas are not reflections that you do once and you are finished with it. But these are reflections that you do over a long period of time. And as you do it over a long period of time, that is when it starts to kind of gather a certain momentum and it starts to work. So this is what this really is all about. This is how you uh, practice these kind of insights. Um, Okay, so um, 
Uh, just Bobby, I'm, I'm supposed to go on to three o'clock, is that right? And then... Uh, yes, Satya. Yeah, okay. And then we have a longer break or do we have a Q? We have a Q&A first of all, that's right. Okay, so yeah. yeah okay, Q&A. sorry. Just getting, losing track of, of time here a little bit. So, okay. <laughs> so this is how you reflect on these things. But remember, as I'm saying, these are not simple insights. These are things that take time. Yeah, it takes time to get used to these kind of ideas of your body being part of the earth around you. So you have to do it again and again and again. And gradually that reality starts to seep in. And as you start to seep in, you lose interest in this body. Yeah, it starts to feel like alien. It starts to feel almost like, why am I holding on to this body? And then as you start to become disillusioned with the body, you detach, the mind becomes separated from the earth element. And when it becomes separated from the earth element, it actually becomes separated from the entire body. It is detaching from that. You no longer regard this body in the same way. And this is very powerful when you do this, because if you do this in the right way and you see the detaching from that body, it means again that you are able to attain samadhi, you are able to watch the breath, you're able to gain all the peace and all the happiness, and all these wonderful things on the path. Why? Because the biggest obstacle to meditation has been left behind. And that is really what we are doing here. So let's um, carry on with the earth element. There's a little bit, there's quite a bit more to be talked about with the earth element. And so then Venerable Sariputta says, there comes a time when the exterior water element is disturbed or it flares up. At that time, the exterior earth element vanishes. So for all its great age, the earth element be revealed as impermanent, liable to end, vanish and perish. What then of this ephemeral body appropriated by craving. Rather than take it to be I or mind or I am, they still just consider it to be none of those of these things. So uh, this is in a sense a even more profound way of thinking about the earth element. Yeah, uh, We know that eventually the earth element as such, the whole of the earth element will eventually disappear. Yeah. And we know this in a number of ways. I think one of the way that is mentioned here is maybe when there is a, I'm not sure exactly what this means, to be perfectly honest with you, the idea that the water element flares up, but it may be that there are times in the history of the world when all the whole earth is water. Yeah, There's nothing but water all the way around. I'm not sure if such times have existed in the, if you look at the geological history, whether there have been times when, every, when the whole earth has been underwater, I'm not sure, but there may be such times, yeah, when everything is just water over the whole earth. And of course, then the earth element is gone. The earth element is submerged. And when the earth element is submerged like that, it is impossible to be a human being on this planet. So in one way, the earth element can be said to have disappeared, yeah? It has vanished because it can no longer be seen and it's possible to survive as a human being on the earth in that kind of way. But there is another sutta which talks about this in an even more profound way. And this is the uh, Seven Sons Sutta found in the Anguttara Sevens. And what this sutta says is that it says there will come a time in the future when the sun starts to expand and the world becomes warmer and warmer and warmer until eventually all the life on the earth is destroyed, until eventually all the oceans in the world evaporate, and until eventually the whole earth itself burns up and the whole earth is gone. Yeah, And that certainly if the whole earth burns up and the whole earth is gone, well, that is definitely the impermanence of the earth element. And what is so interesting about that Seven Sons Sutta is that it is precisely what we know will happen according to modern cosmology. According to modern cosmology, we know that the earth will eventually burn up. 
we know that eventually the sun will expand so much that it is likely to engulf the entire earth and the earth will become almost part of the sun and then it will disintegrate completely. So that sutta is very, very interesting because it seems that the Buddha had an insight into modern cosmology that has only been discovered very recently. How could the Buddha know these things? It is kind of amazing that the Buddha could have some kind of insight into these things. And uh, so this is another way of thinking about the idea of the external earth element vanishing. Yeah, It is not permanent. It is uncertain. We don't know what is going to happen to this external earth element. And you could take it even further. You could take it to the point of maybe thinking about the universal cycles of the universe, the universe expanding and contracting. And the, when the universe contracts, again, at that point when it contracts, all the material in the entire universe is likely to burn up yeah, and to not exist anymore. We will exist in another way. There will be just fire and heat and not really any earth element in the way that we normally think about this. So the earth element is very unstable. It never lasts. Yeah. And then Venerable Sariputta says precisely this, well, if this great earth element, if that is impermanent and liable to vanish and perish, then what about this body of ours? Yeah, this body is far more impermanent, far more liable to perish, far more liable to vanish than the external element. So because it is so ephemeral, because it is so, <laughs> so unreliable, because we cannot hold on to it, even though we have appropriated it by craving, as it says here, even though we are trying to say this is mine, that is impossible because it is so unreliable. And then again, rather than thinking it of this as I, mine, or I am, we consider it as none of those things. We relinquish the earth element because we know how unstable it actually is. And then comes some of the benefits of thinking about the earth element in this way. And Venerable Sariputta, he says here that if other people abuse, attack, harass, or trouble that mendicant, then they understand. This painful feeling born of ear contact has arisen in me. That is dependent, not independent. Dependent on what? Dependent on contact. They see that contact, the feeling, the perception, the choices, and the consciousness as impermanent. Based on that element alone, their mind becomes eager, confident, settled, and decided. So what is going on here? So what is going on here is that, uh, first of all, you have a typical situation like everyone sometimes experience in this world. You are abused by somebody or troubled by someone or harassed by somebody. This life is full of this. Yeah? Life is full of people saying unpleasant things and doing the wrong thing. Everyone in this world experiences this to some extent. And of course, those things are painful. Yeah? And then he says, well, this painful feeling that comes from this, it is arisen because of ear contact. It is be arisen because you have an ear. And when you have an ear, you have no choice but to ear will connect with the sounds or will connect with the earth outside and so you will hear sounds and when you hear sounds well then you can expect to be abused and you can be expect to be harassed because that is part of hearing sounds yeah this is why these things happen and um, so this even this beginning here is actually very interesting yeah? because what it means is that the moment you have an ear the moment we have these sensory organs, the consequence of having sensory organs is that there will be painful feelings. All the sensory organs bring with them both happy feelings and painful feelings. That is the nature of these things. And what you are having here, you are hearing abuse, you are hearing harassment from the outside, you're being attacked by others. That is what you can expect when you have ears. And there's something very beautiful 
it may not sound very beautiful to be attacked and harassed, but there's something very profound about understanding it in this way. Because when you understand it in this way, it becomes impersonal. If we think that the other person is attacking us, if we think that the other person is abusing us, then it is personal and we get angry with the other person in return, right? But when we understand that this is just the nature of reality, this other person is just an agent of the world, an agent of nature that carries out what nature does. They don't really want to attack us. They don't know what they are doing. They are walking in darkness. They are ignorant, just like everyone else. And then they create this painful feeling inside of us without understanding what is happening. It is just nature that is happening. And when nature is happening, because we have ears, we will have painful feeling as a consequence. So this takes away the personality behind this. We no longer get upset with the other person because we know actually it is not about the other person. It is about nature behaving in a certain way. And this is a beautiful way of thinking because it takes away the basis for getting angry. It takes away the basis for getting upset and irritated. And instead, when you see that, you can actually either just remain neutral. You have the upeka, you have the equanimity that you have when you think in a neutral way, or you can even have compassion for the other person because you understand that the other person doesn't really know what they're doing here. They are walking in darkness. They're just following habits. They're just doing things in a blind kind of way. And when you see this, then you become cool. You don't take these things so seriously anymore. So you know it is dependent. It is not independent. Dependent on what? Dependent on contact. As long as you experience the world, as long as you hear, you will experience these things. There is no choice in the matter. This is the way things are. It is dependent on that contact. It will always happen when you have contact. In fact, I would like to sometimes to retranslate the, the word contact. The word contact in Pali is passa. Passa, again, one of these uh, terms we find in dependent origination. It is the uh, sixth factor in dependent origination. And sometimes instead of translating it as contact, which to me is a little bit hard to understand. What does it mean to contact? It means you come into contact with something. Yeah? It is like the initial experience. When you experience something initially, it's like contact. Yeah? But um, contact in the Buddhist idea is more like, it's very similar to the idea of experience. Yeah. So one way of talking about this is to say that, well, the reason I feel painful feeling, it is dependent on experience. So you can translate contact as experience, or you can translate passa as experience rather than contact. And then it is easier to understand in many ways, yeah, because experiencing the world, okay, that we all understand what that means. Contacting the world is a bit more not entirely, not 100% clear what is meant. Okay, we know roughly what it means, but it's hard to pin down. But when we use the word experience, it is very obvious. So you experience the world. When you experience the world, there will be feelings. When there's feelings, there is craving. When there's craving, there is taking up. There's upadana, etc., etc. So you contact the world, you experience the world, yeah? And then you see that experience that you have, that feeling, that perception, those choices, the consciousness, all of that is impermanent. All of that is impermanent because if the experience is impermanent, if the contact is impermanent, then all of the five khandhas that come with that contact, that too is impermanent. Yeah, It goes. So it is no longer interesting. It is not important. You don't take it seriously if you are abused or attacked because you know it is the play of the world, the play of the five senses, the play of the five khandhas doing their thing according to nature. And there's nothing much you can do about it. And when you understand this, then based on that element, the element here is the element of form, understanding the nature 
or form, you abandon it, you give it up. And because you give it up, your mind becomes peaceful, meditation is possible, and then your mind becomes eager, confident, and settled, and decided. Yeah? These, again, are the words that indicate a samadhi experience. So from that understanding of the earth element, again, you attain samadhi as a consequence. You can see how similar this is to the previous sutta, right? The previous sutta had very similar ideas. You contemplate the body, you do the body contemplation, and when you do the body contemplation, samadhi is the outcome. Here we are seeing exactly the same thing, but here it is expanded out. Yeah? Here it shows you how you think about these things. And when you think about these things in this way, if you do the element contemplation like this, then samadhi is the outcome. Let's do a bit more meditation together. <clears throat> 